Hello and welcome to the art of selling online courses. We are here to share winning strategies and secret hacks from top performers in the online course industry. My name is John Ainsworth and today's guest is Ron Stefanski. He's an internet entrepreneur and marketing professor who is passionate about helping people create and market their own online businesses. He owns a digital media company consisting of seven different websites and three YouTube channels. And he's made over a million dollars from his online ventures since starting in 2014. You can learn more from him at onehourprofessor.com where he connects with over 100,000 readers every month. Now, today we're going to be talking to Ron about how to transition from an authority site to making money through courses. Before we dive into our interview with Ron, I've got an important question for you. Do you have already a course or authority website? If you do, did you know there's a short list of techniques that can help you to double to about quintuple your revenue through funnels. There's about eight techniques my team use that help online course creators grow their revenue. The average rate of return is 428%. Now, if you want to find out what they are and which ones are relevant to your business, go to courseprofitreport.com, fill in the survey. It's about 10 questions. My team's going to create a personalized profit increase report for you. It's going to show you which of the techniques are relevant for you, how much more money you're likely to make, and even what to do about it. Now, back to the show. Ron, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much for coming. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here and excited to uh, share some knowledge. Appreciate it. Nice. Okay. So I alluded already to what it is we're going to cover today. This is for people who've already got traffic. They've already got an authority site. They may be making money through ads, some affiliate links, and they possibly opened the idea of making more money through courses. So that's what I want to kind of get into. Why should they think about courses rather than just having their existing ads and Amazon affiliate links? So I think in the beginning, anybody that creates a course, probably the easiest way, the lowest hanging fruit is, hey, let's throw display ads and then do Amazon affiliate or other affiliates. Um, I know Amazon's obviously very popular, but there's a lot of reasons to do that. First off is that you, you know, when you're able to bring people in and bring them into, you know, more ingrained into your own brand, into your own ecosystem, uh, and have them take your courses. It's a lot better to have their information and do that yourself than to take them and refer them over to someone like Amazon uh, or just display ads. Display ads, I've actually made a lot of money from display ads. I like display ads, but at the same time, display ads pay you you know, maybe if you're in really a really good area, maybe like three, four bucks a click, it's not, you know, you just don't make that much money um, from display ads. Most people are making, you know, under like 50 cents a click. So it's actually really, really low. So from a monetization standpoint, it's actually one of the lowest hanging fruit. It's, it's very passive. It's very easy, but it's not very lucrative. So that's the problem there. And then when you get into affiliate, I mean, Amazon affiliate, I purposely have done my best to distance myself. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody that's in, been in the game for a little while, you know that Amazon affiliate is consistently lowering their, it gets you know, worse and worse. Yeah, it gets, worse. and I, I firmly believe that at one time, at some point in time, they're just going to say, you know what, we're done. I think that, I don't know if that's true or yeah. not, but that's how I feel. So to me, that's very alarming to have all of your eggs in their basket or whatever. So, or just that and display ads. So those are all good. But if you want to level up and bring people further into your own ecosystem, if you will. I think that's probably one of the biggest things with online courses because online courses, you're able to control them from when they first hit you to going through a whole course. And you got to understand when they first hit you, like they may not know you right away, right? They may not know, like, and trust you right away. But if you're able to maybe use some type of opt-in to get them to sign into something and start educating them and then get them sold on a course, they're going to then look at you as an expert and they're going to become a true fan Versus somebody that just came in on one page, saw a recommendation of a product, clicked over, and then they never know you again, right? So there is a lot more lifetime value in the customers. So yeah, really courses, there's two, I think, big reasons is number one, they're more ingrained into your brand, which is extremely powerful if you do it right. And then second is obviously it's extremely lucrative if you can, you know, I mean, it depends on what you're charging for the course, but generally speaking, I mean, even if you're charging 50 bucks for a course, right, which is really low, even if you're doing that, that's, I mean, how many clicks and all that are you going to have to get on display ads and, you know, Amazon and it's also passive once you set it up correctly and get the funnel right. It's also a pretty passive thing to have it there. So nice. Yeah. I was chatting with someone the other day and they are sending traffic through to someone selling courses and the yep. person pays them a hundred percent affiliate fee of the initial sale. 
Yeah. It's like, which seems great because you're like, amazing. Yeah. I get all the yeah. money. It's like, yeah, but why are they doing yeah. that? The reason they're doing that is because they make so much more money on the back end mm-hmm. from all of those people who buy that and then buy loads of other courses from them. You're yep. sending all that traffic to them. Wouldn't it be nice to have all of that money for yourself? You know, yeah, it's yeah, harder, having your own it's ecosystem. more work, but you yeah. know. Yeah, it, it is It is quite a bit more work. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why a lot of people do, don't do it. Yeah, I think that might be one. And then also you get into the niche sites and I've had a variety. I don't have like one niche that I stick to, right? I, I've done a lot of them. And I think that's one thing too, is that people are like, well, what can I really sell? I mean, what course? It doesn't really make sense. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know what that should be. You should figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So let's get into this. So if people are hearing this and they're like, great, I like the idea of this. I want to make more money and I want to have that long-term connection with my customers, have that customer lifetime value, not be dependent on Amazon. What is the next step? How do they then figure out like wh- whether it's what courses they should be selling or whatever? Like what's the next step you would say? So you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. So usually what I do, because I absolutely, I mean, there's really two ways of going about it. You can just simply, if you have an email list of sorts and you've been collecting, I mean, the key to this whole thing, right? So I I should step back a little bit. So if you think that you're just going to create a course and put it onto your website and everybody's going to come clamoring and running to buy it. No, that's not how it goes because usually with a course, it's a higher price product. So they need to know, like, and trust you, you know, they need to know that you're kind of an expert. So you have to find a way to kind of curate that relationship and and really build that with them, right? So I think the biggest thing first off is that you have to start collecting emails because you need a one-to-one, well, one-to-many communication technically, but one to where they can reach back out to you and maybe you guys can have a conversation and you can start kind of tailoring some things to them. So that's the most crucial thing in the beginning is to have that communication channel that goes beyond social media or, you know, them finding you on Google. And what was the question again? Sorry, I lost my train like, of What's the next step? So the first step is okay. start collecting an email list, right? That's, yeah, so, the, yeah, so the first step, more. you have to, yeah, you have to have something to, and I mean, like maybe some people can do this through Instagram where they really are involved in that, but it's not easy to do that. So, yeah, it's still it, not so good. if you're not doing that and you're not like, and I mean really involved, like, you know, talking to people live, those sorts of things, then yes, definitely an email list. From there, after you've gotten, you know, their emails and some way to contact them, kind of build up a relationship, At that point in time, you can really go two different routes. Number one, you can simply ask and just say, hey, what are you going to, you know, do like a survey type of thing. I've done that before. It's relatively successful. The problem with it is that if you just ask and they say, oh, we, I'm going to use digital marketing as an example, Mm -hmm. because that's what I do. And you say, you know, guys, here are my different courses. What do you guys want? And they say, we want a course on email marketing, right? And I'd be like, okay, great. I'm going to create that course. I'm going to do this. And then you spend I don't know, I don't know, 40, 50 hours creating the course, doing all the work. And then you turn around and try to sell it and then crickets. That's not a good thing. So you don't want to do that. So what I've always done is when I ask, I get the answer. And then what I always start with, and I mean, it depends on your email list size, but I'll do like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this course. It's going to be due on this date. I'm not sure exactly what the price is going to be yet, but I know that what I'm going to offer you guys right now is the cheapest price it'll be. So I will actually pre-sell the course, Mm -hmm. right? So I'll do that and I'll say, okay, the only way that I'm going to create this course is if I get a minimum of, you know, call it 10 people paying, right? And it it can depend on your your list, but aim kind of low, right? Is is my rule of thumb when you come to that, like, you know, 10 people, five people, 15, 20. I mean, it depends. Like I said, if you have hundred thousand, you might want to say a hundred, but the point is, is that you want to basically not just keep people to say, yes, I need this course, but people to actually pay for your mm-hmm. course. Because so many people love to say, I need it, I need it. And then when you say, great, show me your wallet, they don't. So that's really common. So that is uh, one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is just simply, and this is like, for those that are already an affiliate, this is much easier. Just to find a course on a topic. You could still do the survey if you want. That's kind of up to you. But if you don't want to do that, just find a course on a topic that you think that they might be interested in and put the affiliate link in. Mm-hmm. And you'll know if it starts to sell, hey, this has some demand. And if it doesn't start to sell, that's okay too. Swap it out with a different course, right? So to kind of test it that way. Me personally, I think probably the best way to do it is definitely survey first, just to get the majority. Because every audience, you know, you may think, I've been surprised many times, you may think that you know your audience really well. And then you ask them something like this. And it's like, oh, 
actually that was completely wrong. So you definitely want to ask them because they're not going to be, you know, shy about telling you that. They'll tell you like, hey, this is where I'm really struggling. And that's the other thing is like when you ask it, it might be best to say, what are you really struggling with in your business? Not what should I make a course on? Because then that way they may not even realize that <laughs> you're going to be making a course, but at least it gets, you know, it asks the question in a different way instead of like, what do you want to course on, which some, some people think immediately like, oh, I'm going to have to pay and blah, blah. This is just something like, what's your biggest pain point? And mm -hmm. then you can address it and then kind of sell them on the course. So just a little trickery of words there. So nice. So what we're looking at here is an open-ended question rather than a multiple choice, because we're not trying to presuppose that we know what they're going to, we're going to ask them, what's your biggest pain point? What are you struggling with? What's your frustration? Something kind of like that. Do you, yeah. would you do it just as like an email out to people or do it in a survey format? I've done both. I do like so usually you just mentioned like you don't want to do like closed ended. I don't like to do closed ended, but what I what I may do, I used to do it just with emails and then just get the replies. But that can be really difficult if you have a big email list, right? Because now you're having 50, 100 conversations. It takes a lot of time. So what I've done before is I've actually done a survey as well, just through Google. I've done their, I don't remember what they call it, the Google Forms or whatever. Yeah. And I've done that. And then I've put like multiple choice, like, you know, like back in school, A, B, C, D, and then E is other, and then they can fill something out. So it's like, what's your biggest pain point? You know, like A is this, B is this. So then you kind of find a way to do it that way. And you make an educated guess on what you think that they're going to answer, but you always leave the other field because maybe there's going to be something you didn't think of. And 15 people are going to say other and say the same thing. It's like, oh, okay. So yeah, that's usually how I do it now, just because it's so much easier to manage. Nice. Okay, cool. So survey multiple choice plus other, go through the data, figure out what's likely to be, take that, then either do a pre-sell of your own course or do selling some affiliate course and yep. therefore, and use that to figure out the same thing. Is there demand for this thing? Do people want this thing? And if they do, cool, you go ahead. And if you, they don't, from either one, if they don't buy the pre-sell or they don't buy the affiliate link, try again, try something else. So you haven't spent 50 hours, 100 hours making a course for nobody to buy it. You've got yeah. the topic right. Sweet. Yeah, because that's a nightmare. Because courses are great, but you know, there, there's a big time investment there. You know, and, and it can be very well worth it. Plenty of courses I've created in the past are very well worth it. But you definitely want to verify that information and that there actually not only is demand, but people who are willing to pay before you spend all that time on it. Because like I said, there's a there's a time investment for sure. And what's your thoughts in terms of what size audience or what size email list it starts to be worth doing this? Because if someone's got 20 visitors a month, right, they shouldn't be making a course because they should focus on the traffic. At least that's my opinion on it. I don't know if you'd agree. I 100% agree. Okay. <laughs> I think so me, me personally, so this might sound like a huge mountain to climb for some people, but me personally with my sites, I don't really consider them in any way, uh, I don't consider them exciting until about 10,000 visitors a month, uh, 10,000 page views, I should say a month, not visitors, okay. 10,000 page views a month. I don't know how many visitors that usually is. I mean, some sites that can maybe be 5,000 visitors a month, right? So for those who don't know, there's the page view, which is like one visitor can cause multiple page views, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So I usually at 10,000 page views a month, generally that's how long I wait till, but the truth is, is I have seen there are smaller sites out there that if you're very engaged with your audience, you get them into email right away and you've curated a relationship, you can still sell courses. In fact, courses can be a great way to make money when display ads aren't really going to pay you anything because under 10,000 page views, it's not going to pay much. Affiliate maybe isn't a huge sale, right? So I would say in general, I mean, I wouldn't focus so much on your visitors to your site as much as I would focus on how engaged and how many people are on your email list. I think mm -hmm. that's probably, so I would say, I mean, if I'm really thinking about maybe wait until you get, you know, probably about a thousand people on an email list, which may sound like a ton, but I think that that's pretty reasonable because you're going to have to have a decent amount of traffic to get there. And it takes time to get to that point. Right. And through that whole time too, while, while that list is building, you need to be uh, engaging with your audience. Usually an autoresponder is a good way to do it, right? To continuously engage, but also replying to emails and starting to really know your audience, you know, talking to them directly. Because at that point, at a thousand, we can say, I think that's just a good number of rule of thumb because then you're going to kind of know your audience a lot better than you would have otherwise. It's going to take some time to build to that. So you're not just like, you know, getting to a hundred and then like, I'm going to launch my course because that's going to get a ton of sales from it. But that way, if you're doing it right and you're very engaged with them, 
I think at thousand, it can be, you know, reasonably lucrative and I think it can be worth the time. So nice. Okay. So minimum of a thousand people on the email list. We normally say 3000 people. So that's somewhere in that kind of ballpark. I think this varies actually depending on a couple of things. We've been starting to collect the data around this finance niche, smaller audience is fine. B2B niche, smaller audience is fine. You're in yeah. the hobby space. Bigger audience is going to be because the, the price that you can charge per course is just way lower in like dog training or playing the guitar than it is if you're talking about investing or something like that. So that kind yeah. of affects the number, but somewhere in that kind of ballpark and about 10,000, uh, no, uh, 10,000 page views a month, something kind of like that. Yeah, I, I, it definitely depends. Like it's very niche dependent. It's very niche dependent. There's, there's somewhere it's normal to sell a course and people will be willing to pay that. And then, you know, I've had courses about like cats. Well, good luck, you know, like <laughs> not to say people won't buy a course from that, but you need a lot more there when people are going to look at information about cats, it's not, I'm going to go look at information about cats. And then my next step is to buy a course, right? That's not how that would go. Mm -hmm. But then if you're in like online business, like I am, you know, I'm going to learn how to start a blog and you're going to learn how to do this. The next step is courses. That's not that far of a leap. People kind of mm -hmm. know that because they're trying to learn. Right. So yeah, like you just mentioned, like a hobby niche versus that there's, there's a difference there for sure. Cool. Okay. So someone's got that far and they know what course they are going to make. So they've figured out the topic. They've built the, they've got the audience built. They've built the email list. They've sent out the survey. They've done the pre-sale or they've done the selling the affiliate thing. And they know what topic they're going to do something about. What would you say comes next? Like what's the, what's the next step? For me, whenever I've done courses. So after you figured out all the the details and like, this is definitely the thing. My biggest thing is just jumping right into the outline of the course. I think the planning of the course and just for, for those who, who don't know me either. So I have my website, one hour professor. I've also been college professor for about, I don't even know, uh, 10 years at this point. <laughs> so I've been doing that uh, on the side. So I built courses at that collegiate level to where they do it as well is my point. So usually the formation is, is that after you are, you have the whole topic, you have everything figured out then you want to focus on the, you know, the foundation of the course and actually the planning of the course, all the outline, all the different modules that you're going to have, all the content within those modules. And like me, I usually take like, I'd say like two or three days off and on to really think that through because, and I'm not saying like you should spend weeks on this, please, for the love of God, don't do that because then you'll never get started, right? You'll never build it. But <laughs> I usually spend two or three days because I'll, you know, the first day is I'll, I'll jump in and I'll, Think of everything I could think of and I'll throw it up and I'll and I'll say, okay, that's that's my outline. That's gonna be it. That's good. And then I'll close it. And then I'll come back like the next day or the day after and look at it one more time, two more times, just to really make sure that I'm nailing down everything that I, I want to. Because you'd be surprised if you, you know, if you just do it in one fell swoop and then you just go in and start doing it. There's probably some things that you missed and you may not have even thought about it. So I found that's a thing. I also will go into like, um, like Udemy and just look at other courses similar, you know, because it's not always on the same thing, but similar and see if there's anything that they covered that I completely forgot about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, usually there will be like a thing or two that it's like, eh, should I include it? Should I not? So you can kind of make that decision. So I would say that's definitely the next most important thing is to create the whole outline and foundation of the course. And then I don't know if you want me to keep going from there, but. Well, I one question I've got <clears> there is, some people have authority sites in areas where they are not the topic expert. You know, they've got writers who write the the blog posts, what have you. Does this yep. apply for them as well? Because they're not going to be able to go through and write out the outline themselves. Have you done that? Like in a, have you had sites where you've had um, courses? I've had, so yeah, I actually had a site. One of my biggest sites was helping people who had felonies on their record. <clears throat> I've since sold it, by the way. But people who had felonies on their record get jobs. And it was kind of what you're talking about, kind of a problem, because I knew a fair bit because I had that authority site and it, it got really big. And it was one of the biggest for, in the US for that got really big. But the problem was like, OK, well, I've never actually been in prison. Like, you know, I, there there was things that like I knew and, and knew how to educate, but it was like I'm missing this part of it. So you can always the thing that I've usually done in those cases is actually just partner someone, partner with someone to help you actually create it. And maybe, I mean, depending on how far you want to go down this rabbit hole, maybe if you have the funds, you can also pay them to help do a few lectures within the course or something like that. It just depends on the situation. But yeah, if you're not really all that comfortable with it and thinking like, oh, well, maybe I don't know everything, just go into, you know, like Upwork or Fiverr or one of these, 
find a quality provider because uh, there's not all quality there, but you can find quality providers there. Um, you can also use, just use like in the US, we use LinkedIn and you can find subject matter experts there too. So yeah, just finding like subject matter experts to come in, maybe help you with the outline. And then if if you need them to possibly do a lecture or two and they're willing to do it uh, or just finding someone else who would be willing to do it, I think that's usually the way that I would go about doing it. And another thing with that, when you're creating an outline, I should have mentioned this, is that look at on your actual site within your analytics, look at your most popular content too. I think that that's important because you're going to find out how a lot of people are coming to you. And then those people are kind of equating into, you know, getting, becoming customers or purchasing courses. So make sure that you're understanding how a lot of people are finding you because, you know, your site, let's say that you have a business website, you might have all these different topics and categories, but then all of a sudden when you look in analytics, you know, it's like, Ooh, my project management category is really what's doing well. Right. So if you recognize that, then you're able to cater everything and kind of think about it, you know, in that regard. So yeah. Uh, but just in general, subject matter experts and bringing in others, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I mean, if yeah. you know, and you don't need to sit there in the course and say, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to give you, you know, this person to no, it's just like, this is a, a course that we're both teaching and this is their area of expertise. This is mine. So. Nice. Beautiful. I think people sometimes make that a little harder than it needs to be. Like, well, I can't do this. And it's like, no, nah, sure you can. Yeah. That's all right. No big deal. That's all right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you've got the outline. You might have done that with somebody else, or you might have done it yourself if you're the expert in the topic. What's next? So after you have the outline, then, and you've like 100% finalized it, and that's like, okay, this is this is what I'm going to do. What I like to do is kind of think about supplemental materials at that point, and also the objectives within each like section, if you will. So understanding after this section, the student will be able to blah whatever bleh is, right? So kind of figuring that out. Those those are important um, because that's like, you know, the college teaching, all that stuff. That's what it's all about, you know, all these different, the ways that they're going to learn and, and what the actual outcomes are. Those are very important to not overlook those. Make sure to clearly define those, understand those. And then, yeah, just kind of polish it up and then look at supplemental materials too. So whether that be, you know, not necessarily like, hey, here's a, a different blog post, but like, should you create any checklists of, with it? Should you create anything like that, you know, just to help reinforce? And, and also when you do that sort of stuff, it's nice from a value add standpoint. So now you can turn to the audience and say like, yeah, there's five hours worth of video, but we also have 15 different worksheets or, you know, things like that. I think that that's worth spending the time on because it also just increases the perceived value of everything that you're doing. So yeah, usually from there after the, outlines done, I'll focus a little bit more on the actual course itself and like what else we can add. And then from that point, then it's like, okay, well, let's just start shooting. Uh, and let's start, or I shouldn't say just shooting because some people, maybe it's just writing a course out, whatever it may be. I mean, I feel like videos kind of, I don't want to say a necessity, but kind of at this yeah. point, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten pretty, uh, you know, the way that the, the market is and the way that everything's trending in the industry. So yeah, just shooting video. I mean, me, I, I've done it while well, you can't see that it's all blurred, but I've done it in this room plenty of times. Uh, just a decent little black backdrop. You don't have to have anything super fancy. I use a blue Yeti mic, you know, nothing super crazy, but having that all set up. And I personally kind of rifle through it in about two, three days. I, I, I'm just like a batch processing type of person, right? So mm -hmm. when I shoot, it's like, let's get this done. So, you know, so I'll spend like 72 hours or whatever, really, really focusing on it and heads down and, and doing that and actually shooting the courses. So. Beautiful. Okay. So it's two or three days on the outline and it's two or three days on actually shooting the course is like kind of a reasonable. I think so. Unless you're making like a monster monster course, you know, mm. uh, it might be different, but I'd say, you know, take your time. Don't again, don't spend weeks and weeks and weeks contemplating this because like inaction is the worst thing you can do, but definitely, you know, spend some time. Don't be in a total hurry to get those done. Right. Like, again, I don't want you to take weeks to do it, you know? So maybe give yourself like two to three days to plan it. And at the most, maybe a whole week to actually film it, I would say, just to give someone a cap. Because I know a lot of people like to kind of delay and as excuses and like, well, I get it done. And no, don't do that. Yeah. And I think that kind of fits pretty well with us when we created our own course. It's we spent years becoming expert at something, but you don't have to spend years recording the course about it. You yeah. already know how to do all the things you already got. Like we had all the templates and the swipe files and the checklist and we already had that internally you know the sops would already made so yep. it's just a case of explaining this thing so we made like for each module 
like that outline, you know, what is it that we need someone to understand at the end of it? What stories are we going to tell this kind of thing? And wrote that out each time and then recorded it a few, a few days, maybe a week, something in that kind of ballpark. Okay, so someone's made their course. Now what? What's next step? So me, like recording the course and making the course to different things. So I record the course and then I personally always outsource the editing because I'd rather jam nails in my fingernails than do that stuff. Uh, that's just not... I'm not, and I, I advocate for others to do it. I mean, if you already have a site that's making some revenue, this is more of an investment in your business in the future. This isn't just a cost. Mm -hmm. So yes, outsource that if you can. You can get someone, you know, editing is pretty much a universal language. So I personally, I work with a lot of people in the Philippines. They're great people and they're a fraction of the cost of what it would be in the US or UK or anywhere else, I'm sure. Yeah. So they're very reasonably priced. So I will outsource all the editing and kind of, you know, that, that whole process of like, let's get all the videos edited. Let's, uh, you know, actually kind of put the course together, I guess you could say um, that, you know, that can take probably between a week to two weeks total, depending. I mean, if you have a really responsive editor and it's really quick and not a huge course, it could be shorter than that, but that usually takes a little bit of time just to make sure that it's kind of formatted the right way. So yeah, I, I definitely though uh, advocate for you to um, outsource that and have somebody else handle all that for you. Otherwise it's just a huge drain on your time. I mean, you as a site owner, you're already making money from the site, you know, from display ads, affiliate ads, you're already making money. And then it's like, okay, you're going to become the subject matter expert and you're going to be teaching the course. So you're in front of a camera, you're doing that sort of thing. You don't need to be an editor too, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's a low return on investment activity for you. So don't do that. Don't make that mistake. Just have somebody edit it. And then, yeah, pretty much just put it all together. And then you have to look into the actual selling of the course after it's created. But yeah. Nice. All right, cool. And where would you, any preferences you have around where to upload it? Thinkific, Teachable, Kajabi, anything? <sighs> um, me personally, it, there's so many different platforms out there. I have like, I'm actually on Google, one of the top blogs about this. There's so many different platforms out there. It's like, it's nauseating at this point. I think it was well, <laughs> the, uh, on my own blog post. I think I have over 25 at this point. So me personally, I really like Thinkific, but that, I mean, there's so many others out there. I don't want to say like, this is the end all be all. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of them have a lot of unique little bells and whistles and probably the only big thing that you want to pay attention to when you're choosing and I'm well, two big things when you're choosing a course platform is what are the fees related to it? So like think Epic, they do have a free plan, but that's every time that you sell a course, I don't remember what the percentage is, but they'll take a percentage of the course sale unless you upgrade to a premium plan in which they don't take that amount, but then you're paying monthly. So basically the pricing and their structure. And then the other thing is, is do you want an all-in-one platform or do you not want that? So an all-in-one platform, like there's platforms that are more focused just on like, you know, really courses and schools, right? Uh, which is fine. A lot of them are focused on that. But then there's ones also that, you know, do you want to do coaching? Do you want to do mentorship? Do you want to have email marketing in there? So, you know, some, some of them will do a lot more of that than others. So that's probably the two main things. But for those that are like, I own a niche site and I'm looking to do something that is a free plan to kind of test this out, not invest a ton of money in it, blah, blah, blah. I recommend Think Effect for that. Cool. Beautiful. Okay. So someone's got the course uploaded. Now they're going to need to, they've got their email list. They've hopefully been growing that for a little while. They need to sell the course to the email list. What's the steps there for you? So now you have to look into what is your funnel going to be and what is your sales strategy going to be? Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably, well, it will make a break. How your, how your course does. So in terms of sales, I mean, if you have a lot of people that are big advocates of your brand, it's probably going to be easier to sell your courses, but you kind of had to make a decision. Do I want to do evergreen course sales to where you set something up once you have a funnel to where, you know, they come into your email list and after let's say 20 days of value or whatever, then you're pitching them on the course in evergreen, or you can do kind of like limited time you know, I'm opening up the course and I'm closing back down the course. Mm -hmm. So I personally tried the evergreen course site structure or course structure. For me, that wasn't that successful. Um, not to say I didn't sell any, but I don't know exactly why. I mean, I didn't dive deep, deep into my funnel and everything, but I basically came to the conclusion that 
I was kind of creating fake scarcity there. And I don't think that that was really all that effective. And I think maybe people saw through that. I tried different ways to, you know, do it and like, Hey, over time, we're going to increase the cost, blah, blah, blah. But it was like, okay, this, this just, for me, whatever reason, I don't know. I, I didn't really nail it. I know some people can do really well with that. I never nailed that down. So that's the one way, which is like, it sounds really nice because it's all on autopilot, but I feel like it's, it's also a lot more difficult personally, in my opinion, to make that happen. So after not doing so great with that, I thought, okay, well, let me test doing like limited time. You know, the course is now open, the course is closed. And for those wondering, why do people do that? You do it because scarcity and people are going to miss out and Hey, it's going to open right now, but it's going to close down and it's going to be gone for a while. I think that that's a really powerful sales tactic in general, because when you get people in, they find you, they know, like, and trust you. They want more from you. And you're like, I have this exclusive course. It's great. It's amazing. This amazing community with it, blah, 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 blah. And if you're able to really sell them on, hey, this is a lot more than what you're just getting from the blog or YouTube channel or Instagram or whatever it may be, um, a lot of them will be a lot more likely to incline to jump in. So usually, like I said, the email list is very important. So it's coming up with that proper cadence funnel strategy to actually get people, you know, I, I don't think that you should just launch your course and then email them and say, Hey guys, just launch my course. Uh, it's open for 72 hours. I don't recommend that because that's kind of like, you know, hitting them with a baseball bat in the face. I mean, it's kind of like, boom, it just comes out of nowhere. Like what, where did this come from? So usually you want to create some type of funnel to where you usually I'll do it in like a week's time uh, as I'll have, I think right now my, my launch sequence is seven days. So I'll have a week's time to where I'll, you know, send an email kind of explaining a, a topic related to the course or something that's related to the course. And then you're kind of easing them into the actual pitch as opposed to just blindsiding them with a pitch out of nowhere and saying, bye within 72 hours or it's out of here. So you kind of have to hone and figure out what your uh, sales funnel is. I think is is definitely the biggest thing at this point. Nice. That's pretty similar to what we have. We do like a week's content that is about that topic. It kind of warms people up. It gets them thinking. The people who are interested in that topic are paying more attention to the emails because it's yep. kind of relevant to them. It's reminding people you're a topic expert in the area. It's getting them thinking about that thing. And then we'll open up the car. And what we actually tend to do is the course is still available the rest of the time, but it's just a high, it's at a high price. And then we have a discount for a week, oh, okay. let's say. Okay. So it's not exactly the same, but it's the same concept. It's still creating urgency and scarcity because it's like you can get this cheaper now and then next week it's going to be back to the higher price. Exactly. So, yeah. 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 And that that takes care of the whole, I guess, the whole evergreen part of it, right? Like, yeah, you can always purchase it, but the only time, the only way to get the discount is at this time. So it's, it's same idea of scarcity for sure. We've done so. both, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's, not, it's not that. It's It's quite nice having it you get more urgency when it's only available at that point, but yeah, then it means you don't get the sales in between. So there's like pros and cons with it, but it's the same basic idea. Okay, cool. And yeah. then, yeah, then, then have the pitch. We tend to do it for like five days. You're talking about 72 hours. That's so like three days. So, you know, it's, it's not enormous differences for people. Nice. Okay, cool. So someone has done that. They've sent out the useful content. They've sent out the promotional emails. They've managed to make some sales of their course. When, would you then promote it again? Like how long do you wait before you then making the offer again? So usually what I'll do, I'll let the course go all the way through, you know, go, go through the whole sequence and everything. And typically, I mean, it just depends on how often you want to sell me personally. I do it once a quarter at this mm -hmm. point uh, with one other yeah. professor that's, you know, every three months or so roughly, not exactly because I honestly don't want to be that predictive. Like, I don't want people to be like, oh, here's, you know, week one of, of quarter two, here comes the course that I don't want people to kind of, I, I think that I do it and I don't know that necessarily people know that I do that uh, is, yeah. and that's on purpose. Right. So it may seem like I may be off by a few days or maybe a week here or there, but that's roughly what I do um, is the beginning of every quarter is I'll do it. And then I just open it up and I say, Hey, you know, there is two reasons when, whenever I'm, whenever I open up my course, there's two reasons. Number one is that the price is likely to go up, which it does because, well, I should say number one, actually, before I talk about that is I'm opening this up. I'm going to get people in and I'm going to get their feedback and I'm going to improve on the course. And because I'm going to be improving on the course, next launch, it's very likely that I will be increasing the price, right? So that's kind of a way to rationalize it with the person that's reading on the other end. Cause it may be like, why are you going to increase the price? Growth? Well, that's why, because there's more value there. So we're letting a, a almost like a cohort into the course mm -hmm. to 
go through it and everything, ask them questions, get you know close to your students, find out what they like, don't like, what they want to add a data, yada, yada. And then next launch, you can increase the price a little bit. So yeah, that's typically after a launch. That's usually what I'll do. But yeah, like three months. I mean, you could do four months. You could do a month too. You could do every month if you wanted. You just got to be aware that if you're like, if you're going my route of like opening and closing the course and you're opening it every month for four days, five days at a time, I mean, it's not really that urgent, you know, because people are like, oh, yeah. I'll just wait till next month. I'll wait till next <laughs> month. So, so yeah. So, and, and I never ever have told them, I'm only opening this up every three months. I've never said those words to anybody. It's more or less like my own dirty little secret that I have in my head, right? Like, I'm just going to open this up from here to there and then go from there. But yeah, that's, that's what I've done. And that's been, uh, since I've been doing that, I found more success than just having it on the, you know, autopilot kind of, I, I don't want to say lazy way of doing it, but that was like the more passive way of doing it was my like ideal thing. And for me personally, that didn't work out, but this, the way that I'm doing it now with one hour professor specifically, I've had it with other sites too, but with this site specifically, that's worked out pretty well. Nice. All right. So we've identified that courses make more money than affiliate stuff and the ads planned out what might be the topics for it based on existing blog posts that gets the highest traffic come up and what we know about the audience put out the uh, start to build the email lists ideally start sent out a survey to find out what topics people are interested in done a pre-sale or sell some affiliate courses figured out what course people are interested in planned out the outline made the course send out the promotion made a bunch of money from it and then three months later we're doing it again sweet that is pretty fucking thorough, isn't it? I like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And you can, you know, soon enough, you'd be able to afford an island. Um, but no, for, <laughs> so like the one thing I will say that's actually very big to understand for anybody that's getting into this, your course, your first launch may not go that well. It may not be everything you wanted. It may not be perfect. That's okay. Usually what that means is look at, you know, this is where you have to dive into the data a little bit. Look at your open rates. Look at the subject lines that you're using. You know, look at, are people engaging? Are they not? Look at those things, each segment of the way, each step of the way, and try to figure out like, mm, this could be the weak step, right? Like this could be the one that's not really doing it, so to speak. Um, that would be my one piece of advice. So it can definitely get better over time. Um, Cause I can tell you my first, I think I probably had launched courses like six or seven times before I finally got it to where I was like, okay, now it's, now we're seeing something good, right? Yeah. So that does take some time. Um, and then the second thing I'll say is in my sequence, my launch sequence, the thing that I wasn't doing enough of that I should have been doing more of for sure. I wasn't focused as much on testimonials and positives of other students kind of proof, if you will, mm -hmm. that was actually something. And, and you really struggle when you're starting a course because it's like, well, I don't have students. How am I going to possibly get any testimonials? The answer to that is like, we talked about like anybody that uh, earlier we talked about, oh, you know, get them to pre-sell all mm -hmm. that release a beta version of the course, just to those people, you know, like just talk to them and say, Hey, here's a beta version. I need you to give me feedback and just kind of, you know, keep messaging them and, and make sure that you get those responses back and say, okay, what is it I need? What is it I don't? What do you like? What do you dislike? Get that information. It's really important. It's not, I think the thing with a lot of site owners that are like, yeah, you know, affiliate and display is great. It is because it's really passive, but it's also, if you want to make more money and you know, a lot more, uh, you need to get much more in tune with your audience and this is a great way to do it. But yeah. So just understand that like, may not be perfect at first, but it can definitely get better and then focus a lot. Well, my mistake that I had focus more on not just testimonials, but you know, like real world applicable things and may have that come across in your messaging. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Cause I didn't, that was a mistake I made. Uh, and it was a mistake and it's gotten better since, but yeah. Nice. And I think one of the things I wanted to throw out there as well in here is that if you've got, we've talked about like minimum numbers of what you need to have, but if you've got a stonking great site, this can be massive. You know, you've yeah. got 200,000, 500,000, 2 million visitors a month, and you're currently just doing ads and affiliate stuff. You're sitting on a gold mine potentially. Yes. Like this is like, and there are people like that out there listening to yeah. the, listening to this right now. There are people who I have that big audience <laughs> and you should be thinking to yourself, oh my God, I should fucking do this, you know? Yeah, no, I, I get it because again, I, I think it comes down to like lifestyle design, lifestyle choice and how passive you want your business to be. And I get it. But at the same time, if you get this right, you could easily double whatever revenue you're getting with the course because courses, forget like almost all affiliate programs that you're in, 
and I know for a fact display ads, it's a lot harder to make a hundred dollars there than it would be from a course, right? Or a thousand dollars, whatever your course may be priced at. So yeah, it, it it's a very lucrative thing um, once you put in the effort and get it right. But I think one of the biggest things, and I've been guilty of this in the past, I've gotten a lot better at this, by the way, is this is how I got to seven sites, right? I have a portfolio of seven sites, which sounds really cool, but then it's like, okay, well, why do you have seven sites? It's because I do display ads and affiliate and I make good money. And then I'm like, you know what? This is cool. Oh, you know what's also cool is this topic over here. And then I pivot. <laughs> so now that I've been in this for some time, I don't do that as much. Now I say, okay, you know, we're doing good with affiliate. We're doing good with, with display marketing. What else can I do to make money on this site? That's a okay. much smarter way of doing it because you already have the entire site built. You already have the traffic. You already have the audience. Don't just say, okay, great. And pivot. I've made that mistake. Don't do that. Uh, focus on how else can I make money with the site and try to, one of the things I always say is like, think about it as squeezing a lemon, right? If you're squeezing a lemon, you're getting, you know, all the all the juice out of there. And then and it's like, well, what else, you know, instead of just grabbing another lemon, what else is it that I can do to squeeze a little bit more juice out of that lemon? And for a lot of people, there's a half a lemon that's ready to be squeezed with these <laughs> online courses. There's a lot of juice there. Um, it's definitely one of the the better ways to monetize a site once you, you know, have really figured it out. But yeah, have some patience. It takes some time to figure it out. But once you figure it out, it's it's very well worth it. Beautiful. And if people are listening and they're like, okay, I could do with some more info about this. What what have you got that you could point people to that could help them to kind of understand any of the topics we've been covering? Yeah. So with my own site, so, you know, how, how crazy is this? So I have free courses uh, now. So with, with my own site, so onehourprofessor.com, if you go there, there's a call to action in the top right, uh, just says free courses. I have a course on YouTube, a course on keyword research for those that are like into blogging, kind of figure out the strategy and also a course on how to start a blog. I don't have a course on how to create courses yet. I just haven't gotten around to creating one, but at least for those other folks, it'll help them out. Perfect. I'm just making a note of the link. It's one hour professor. I think it's one hour professor.com slash courses. I think it's yeah. I'm going to make sure. Yeah. One hour professor.com slash courses. Perfect. And if you've got a site that's got a bunch of traffic, if you've got like, if you've not got courses yet, but you've got over a hundred thousand visitors a month, then you can get in touch with us. We can help you out with this whole process. We only charge based on results with that. Uh, we don't work with people who haven't got courses and got smaller sites, but if you've got over a hundred thousand, get in touch, drop me an email, John, J O H N at data driven marketing.co. Man, this was awesome. I really appreciate you coming on and laying it out. You've we've made this whole thing just so kind of step by step and helped people understand. I think some people in a year's time are going to be like, God damn, I'm making a bunch more money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. I really, I, you know, take me up on it. Uh, it really does work. It's just a matter of having the patience. It's just, it's so different because I know people who have a lot of websites and how they think because I'm one of those mm -hmm. people. And it's a little bit of a different school of thought and it takes a little bit more patience. And there's something, a lot more tweaking that you have to do than just a site. Cause a site, you can outsource a lot of things, throw it all up and boom, boom, boom. People keep coming. It's not, you know, the feedback loop is a little bit slower, but once you get it right, that's the key to the whole thing. Once you get it right, it's very, very well worth it. It's, it could very easily be your highest revenue channel, very easily, uh, wherever, whatever you're making from month now, it may be irrelevant if you're able to do this right. So. Beautiful, man. Awesome. Cool. If you're listening and you really enjoyed this and you want to get future episodes, subscribe wherever you listened. If you want to get Ron's courses, it was onehourprofessor.com slash courses. And thanks so much for listening. Really appreciate it. And Ron, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.